is perhaps the most personal business that families and individuals ever have to attend to, managing the interests and assets of a loved one after they pass away or become incapacitated. Most people don't know it until the day they need to, but the Allen County Courts have a role in making sure that the best interests of those involved are handled with competence, care, and compassion. I'm John McGauley, and on this episode of In Session, we're talking to Allen Superior Court Magistrate Phil Houck about the role of the courts in wills, estates, and guardianships. On our last episode of In Session, we talked about that inevitable day when many of us will need to go to court for one reason or another. Hundreds of times each year, the reason that brings people to court, often for the very first time, is to resolve issues involving wills, estates, and guardianships. They are the sorts of challenges that never wind up in the news, but always have an impact on the people involved. If you come to the courthouse for such a matter, chances are really good that you're going to wind up in front of Allen Superior Court Magistrate Phil Houck. Magistrate Houck joins me on this episode to talk about these important pieces of very personal court business. Magistrate Houck, welcome to In Session. Thanks very much, John. Uh, 37 years in this business, and I have been in the news a few times for some of my cases, which... Uh, we don't hopefully have to go into, and they weren't necessarily good for good reasons. Uh, but you're right. We fly under the radar, but most everybody at one time or another in their life, they're going to have probate court touch their lives yeah. in some way. Uh, the administration of people's estates, guardianship matters. Those are not as common, but I've done 20,000 wills. I've probated some. In fact, I stopped counting. Maybe it's 30,000 mm -hmm. and um, about 10,000 guardianships over the years. So. I mean, I know people who've been in front of you for guardianships. My dad's taking care of somebody from church. I mean, this this touches a lot of people that you you may or you may know. It does. Elderly folks, developmentally disabled. Mm -hmm. That's a very common situation with younger people that we have to appoint guardians when they age out, when they're legally adults. When you become 18 years old, no longer can mom and dad just control your life legally, yeah. but with a guardianship. If that person still needs continued help and supervision, then the guardianship, the probate court has to step in then. All right, let's start with a round to meet the judge. Take a moment, if you would, tell us about yourself and your career, and don't forget to tell us why you already clearly sound like this is not your first time behind the microphone. <laughs> okay. I do have a second career, uh, or I should say a second passion. It really is a passion in my life, and I've been in doing, ra I've done radio for 30, some of them, 65, I don't know. I started doing, and mostly all sports radio. I started doing high school and football and baseball and basketball back in the mid early 90s and uh scared to death i remember the first time i knew the guy who was doing the play-by-play -play and he goes oh you know a lot about football you could come on i go oh, what will i say you know i was just so scared and uh, but since that time i did 14 years of st francis football i did all their first games of their when they started that program rode buses all over did games from everywhere um, and I have a radio show that I do on Notre Dame football, and now that's really become a passion. So if you're listening to this, when you get done with the podcast, go to fightingirishpreview.com, and you can see my website. But that's just what I do part-time. For 36 years, 37 now, I've been in the probate business in Allen County, and I, I have a law degree. I graduated from Valparaiso University in 1986, and um, before that, Indiana University in 83. I was a political science major, and then I went to law school at Valparaiso, graduated in 86, and I came to the Allen Spirit Court as a law clerk, worked for the Honorable Robert L. Hines, mm -hmm. and if there's anybody out there that, do you know, did you know Judge Hines at all? I didn't, Judge, but the name rings a bell. Yeah, yeah, well, he was kind of a legend around here until he passed away, I think, in mid-90s anyway. Uh, retired probably around 1992, I think. But he, I, I served as his law clerk for a year, and he happened to be the probate judge at the time. Mm -hmm. And so as his law clerk, I, I just naturally kind of learned a lot about probate. And ironically, or, or as luck would have it maybe, while I was in law school, I actually kind of took a liking to my property courses. And there was also a, a class I took called wills and estates or trusts and estates something like that t and e i think we called it mm -hmm. and I, I wasn't top of the class let's put it that way in law <laughs> school i did okay but those classes i did really well in, and i just kind of liked them and ironically or as luck would have it as i said i ended up uh, working for the judge who did probate cases uh, i served my one-year term and at that time uh, the position as it was known with the allen Superior court it was called probate commissioner 
and that's that's a statutory position we could still have a probate commissioner by the way but we don't technically mm -hmm. anymore in allen county but the statute provides that the judge can appoint a probate commissioner and the probate commissioner at that time was fran gall i'll be darned <laughs> And we know who Fran Gall is. I've heard that name, too. <laughs> anyway, Fran had just taken, I can't remember if she was moving over to the prosecutor's office or maybe to circuit court for a, a hearing officer's job. Mm -hmm. But it was it, it just dovetailed right at the end of my term, and the, the job came open, and I interviewed for it. Really didn't think I would get the job, and I had some private practice offers at the time. Actually went on vacation for a week, came back, and one of your predecessor, Jerry Noble, was on the phone saying, hey, <laughs> you got the job. <laughs> Do you want it? I go, well, yeah. So I started with the Allen Spear Court. Then that, at that time, I was doing probate cases in the morning, or no, I should say in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And in the morning, I actually worked for the criminal division in the in the tra misdemeanor and traffic division uh, doing arraignments. And so for six months, I was shared by the two divisions. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was known at that time that that arrangement was going to end. It had been going on for some time and would end at the end of the year based upon what had been approved by mm -hmm. uh, county council. So at the end of the year, then I went full-time as the uh, probate commissioner for the Allen Superior Court Civil Division, and I've been doing that really almost ever since. Mm -hmm. I also spent a lot of time hearing small claims cases. For a while, I would actually spend one day a week in small claims court to help out. There would be a overflow or somebody couldn't do it one of the judicial officers was absent for some reason. Then in 1995, all of what we referred to as a junior judicial officer, all the junior judicial officers in the state of Indiana by statute were made magistrates. And so my position morphed into that in 95. So I was, went from being a county employee to being a state employee in 95. And so I'm still here today. When they interviewed me for the job, Judge Hines and Vern Sheldon were the two judges at the time that interviewed me. I, there was a third one, uh, Dalton McAllister, I believe at the time, but for whatever reason, he was not involved in this process. And Judge Hines, I remember him looking at me and saying, and there had been some turnover in the position uh, before me. Fran did it for two years, somebody before that had done it for one year, somebody had done it for three years, so there hadn't been a lot of continuity. And Judge Hines, he looked at me, he goes, well, you know, if you do take this job, it would be really great if you would like commit to doing it for at least five years. Well, I love Judge Hines, and I would do anything for the man, and I would say that I fulfilled that <laughs> because I've now done it for 36, 37. I intend to, uh, and I certainly intend to retire from this position at some point. Now, point of trivia, I believe that having appointed you in 1995, aren't you the longest serving currently judicial officer in Superior Court and really in the Allen County Courts? overall that's correct when charlie pratt charlie had a year or two on me judge pratt when he retired last year i took that mantle okay. from him he had actually started with the court i think a year before i did and uh, so he always helped so i i don't feel like a really old guy but actually more and more i guess i do uh, because I certainly started this job when I was really young, you know. And I was the young guy, and I'm like, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. All of a sudden, I'm in courtrooms, and I'm I can send people to jail and stuff like that. And and you know, it's a huge responsibility. You feel it. Although you know, I was a young guy, and I'm saying, yeah, this is what I'm trained yeah. for. Well, I didn't know anything then compared to what I think I know now after 36 years. But you know, it's been a great ride, and uh, I I still got a few years left in me. Well, we were only just. It through the Fighting Irish preview part of that before I was already afraid I was going to lose my sweet podcast gig here. <laughs> well, well I'm, one of these days I'm going to interview you, John. And that'll be uh, episode 14 or something. And it'll be a lot shorter <laughs> than this one because I am not that interesting. Oh, I don't know about that. I know a few things about you. You've got some <laughs> hobbies, too. <laughs> well, yeah, let's let's dig into the, the the meat of why we're here. You know, when when it comes to matters involving probate law, you are one of the preeminent experts in the Indiana judiciary. You've been hearing Thank cases you. in this area of the law since day one of your service with the courts. You've contributed your expertise at the statewide level. So let's get started picking your brain and let's start with the basics. For those of us without the benefit of your expertise, what does it even mean to hear that somebody's estate is in probate? What does that mean? That means that when that person died, they had probate assets. 
and not everybody's assets have to go through probate. For example, if I died and let's say the whole, the only thing I owned was maybe just a little personal property like most people do and maybe a bank account with a few hundred bucks, but I had a big life insurance policy, but it's made payable to my spouse or to my kids or something like that, that's not a probate asset. That just contractually will pass to those kids. It has nothing to do with the probate court. A lot of things are like that. Things like IRA accounts and you have beneficiary designations designations. Those are not probate assets. So we have nothing to do with that. On the other hand, if I died and I have a brokerage account or a house that's in my name, then the probate court uh, at with some limits, and there are we'll talk about that in a minute, Mm -hmm. has to get involved to determine to make sure that those assets are distributed to the correct person and also that any bills that you owed when you died get paid. When I say there's a limit, Mm -hmm. in the state of Indiana, if your estate probate assets now is worth less than $100,000, then there's a summary process that the court doesn't have to be involved in that you can implement to transfer those assets. And you, there's a state form that you execute, it's called an affidavit for transfer of assets without administration. And uh, you can use that to transfer those assets, titles to cars, things like bank accounts, things like that can be transferred if it's under 100,000. But if it's over that, then you're probably gonna have to come see me. Well, you won't be coming to see me, <laughs> but your heirs will be. <laughs> And you may have just answered my my next question, and and this this shows that you know fortunately this particular topic hasn't touched me or my wife just yet. But you know, does every estate wind up in probate regardless of the presence of a will? And if the answer is no, what does it take to avoid it entirely? You waited for me for about one or two minutes because there was a lawyer in my office mm-hmm. before we started doing this, and this this topic actually came up. Most people think that if a lot of people think that I have a will, so it's yeah. right there in the will. I don't need probate court. No, that's not it at all. Mm-hmm. The will simply defines who you want to be your to receive your estate. It's still the court's job to make sure that the wishes, as you have expressed them in your will, are carried out. That's what the probate court does. By the way, if you don't have a will, a lot of people think that's a disaster. Well, you should have a will because you want things to go to where you want them to go. And there are other things you can do in a will, like nominate somebody to be a guardian of your minor children. Mm-hmm. That's another probate thing. But if you don't have a will, it's not true that the, that the state doesn't just take everything. What happens is this, there's a law that defines who your heirs are, and those are the people that get it. And it usually goes to those who you think would normally be the natural objects of your bounty. That's a probate lingo. For, you know, if I die and I don't have a will, and I got, let's say, a million dollars, and I, I have no spouse, and I have four kids, well, it's going to be divided four ways between my children. That's who gets it if I don't have a will. But the will is certainly instructive and helpful, but it's not the end of the story. You still have to come to probate court if your assets are worth more than 100000 yeah, in probate assets. We get a lot of questions in my office. I'm the court administrator for anybody I have to introduce myself to in a, in a while. One of the most common questions we get from the public is from people who've lost a loved one, there's no will to be found, and they have absolutely no idea what to do next. How do they get the process started of settling an estate for which the person's final wishes may not be known? Well, again, in that situation, if there, if no will is found, and a lot of times wills are found, and sometimes it takes a while. Uh, a will, by the way, can be brought into the court any time within three years of the date of death. Uh, there's a presumption created if it, if it doesn't happen within three years of the date of death that you died without a will. In fact, it, by law, you died without a will at that point. You, that, that keeps people from manufacturing wills, <laughs> which does happen. The simple answer is you really need to get some legal advice. Yeah. And I say that from this standpoint. And I tell people this all the time. What they need to do is they need the legal advice because what I've told them is 99.9% of all the cases that come before me are done with the assistance of a lawyer. Mm -hmm. That one-tenth of 1% takes up about 25% of my time because... You didn't go to law school, folks, and you're. It's really important. That you, yeah. This is not a real simple thing that you can just kind of do it yourself in almost every situation. And, and a lot of people will argue with me about that, and they'll try to do it themselves. And sometimes they slog their way through it, but that's actually quite rare. Uh, you need a little bit of legal advice, and uh, sometimes the lawyer is going to tell you that the, you don't. You don't need me because here we can get this all done without going to court. Yeah. So. 
that's that's really the first step. Get some legal advice. And I hate to say it, but it really does speak to the importance of a will. Yes and no. And we, we've touched on that. Uh, the, having a will is important because you want it to find who is going to receive your assets, uh, particularly if it's somebody other than might normally get your assets. Like we talked about a minute ago, when you're in test state, meaning without a will, then it's going to go to your next of kin. Mm-hmm. Divided among your spouse, your kids. If you don't have a spouse or kids, uh, it can sometimes it can go to your parents, nieces, nephews. It, it spreads out as until you find that first level of a relationship, and they get your assets. That's intestate. But if you have a will, the will certainly you, you nominate who you want to do the work. That is the personal representative in your will. You can, and that gets a statutory priority. The court appoints who's going to administer your state, and it doesn't have to be who's in your will, but there's a statutory priority that we have to honor unless there's a good reason not to. And when I say we, the court. So we're going to appoint, uh, and usually you nominate like one of your children to, to be that administrator. Mm-hmm. But it's important, and you've talked to that person. Yeah. Uh, so you prepare them. They know a little bit about what you have, and usually you're going to prepare that person for that job that they're going to have to do someday, What where the insurance policies are located, uh, what the scope of your assets is, things like that. The other thing that I briefly mentioned that's really important for new parents write a will nominate somebody to serve as guardians of your children now it's the worst situation almost the worst situation imaginable that both parents might die in some common catastrophe disaster accident of some sort young parents especially with a child who is under the age of 18 but you can establish and I know this is important to young parents who would take care of that child if you would meet your, an early demise. Obviously, in that situation, it's important to have talked to that person yeah. <laughs> as well in advance and to get their acquiescence that they would do that in the case of that disaster. We, In my own personal case, uh, we did that with uh, a sibling mm-hmm. uh, who also had children about the same age as ours and it was a reciprocal agreement they wrote us into their me and linda my wife into their will and we wrote them into to our will that they would take care of it but now my kids are grown so that never came about but that's an important reason to have a will i'm shockingly old to have a minor child but i I do and we just took care of that in the last year and i know i sleep a little better at night knowing that that that's taken care of good for you in a previous life uh, i i held the very obscure position of allen county recorder and got this call shockingly frequently there's a common misconception out there that if you have a will there's a copy on file somewhere at the courthouse Unless it's been filed by that person making the will somewhere in the recorder's office or somewhere else, which is really rare. That's not true, is it? It, It's not. uh, Now, about Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, Indiana instituted a law that allows you to put a will on file with the clerk of the court uh, prior to your death. And it's so, you know, last time, maybe... Three, four years ago, some lawyers were, were trying to find a will in a case, and we couldn't locate the will. When I say we, they, it was they, the court system. And so they went to the clerk to say, any chance that anybody brought in the will? Mm-hmm. And I think at that time, and this was maybe after five or six years that this law had been in existence, the, the clerk had like six wills. Oh, wow. I haven't visited it, it yet, but my I recollect that, you know, there was a cost involved. And, you know, if, if you take normal precautions and make sure people know where your will is and usually the lawyer actually keeps the will yeah. for safekeeping yeah. which isn't fail safe but it's pretty safe if you do that that's where the will is and that's probably a better way but there is a cost involved in putting your will on file and then if you ever want to revoke that will or change that will then you got to go through another yeah. process again so it hasn't been a real popular thing to do <laughs> but nonetheless uh, there is that option available but no it's not just on file until somebody dies. You don't really have a will. Your will isn't of any legal significance until you die. Yeah. And, and the court recognizes that, yes, we see that it was properly uh, executed, that, yes, that is a last will and testament, and it then becomes a matter of public record. And the reason I mention that is because, like you, you said earlier, you, you mentioned knowing where insurance documents and, and things like that are. It's, it's just another reason why it's really important for families to know where those documents are. It is, and uh, I can remember my dad, who lived to the 
to the ripe age of 99, passed away within the last year. But I can remember him about 15 years ago, mm -hmm. and he had this big desk, and it's still there. He actually had moved into my sister's house up in the South Bend area, and but he gave me the tour of the desk and showed me where yeah. all he kept all here's where the insurance policies are and here's these other important papers and tax information and it is probably in fact not probably it's important uh, that you do confide in somebody that you trust yeah. obviously with that sort of information I've because it's the same it, tour it makes things easier yep yeah, without a doubt. It's uncomfortable. I mean, when you it get is. that call from your know, mom and dad suggesting that you come over on a Saturday afternoon and find out where everything, it's uncomfortable, but it's it's important to do it. Yeah, uncomfortable, true. And mm -hmm. if you knew my dad, you, <laughs> you would know what a big deal it was for him to like to reveal all that stuff because yeah, yeah. he, he was so used to, to doing stuff, as most people are. They're very they're private as far as that sort of information goes. But I guess he figured if you, if you can't trust the... Uh, the probate magistrate, you can't trust anybody, <laughs> so he was willing to share all that information with me. What happens to a person's estate if there just is no will, nothing documenting their wishes at all? Yeah, that's, that, that's the intestate situation okay. that we talked about. It's defined by statute who gets your, it's your next of kin, basically, yeah. who gets it. We do have cases, though, where you never find, th this is interesting, where you actually can't find heirs. And again, I had a case just today, I'm talking to a lawyer about it, and a person who had Im immigrated from uh, South Korea, didn't have family here. You know, they've hired an expert, to get, and South Korea is very private of, as far as revealing that sort of information. I mean, we've done this international investigation trying to find heirs, can't find the heirs. What happens then is your estate will do what it's called an escheat, E S. C-H-E-A-T, and it goes to the state. The state will hold it for a certain period of time, and then it goes, I think, it's to the general fund after like mm -hmm. seven years if, if nobody comes about to claim it. We've been talking so far with Magistrate Phil Houck of the Allen Superior Court Civil Division about his work in the area of estates, wills, probate, and guardianships. Let's talk personal back here for a second. You've been doing this. We've we've talked about how long. And for as long as you've been focused on hearing cases in this area of the law, it's obviously of interest to you. What drew you to this and, and what's kept you here for so long? I, I like the lifestyle of a judicial officer. My friends who went into private practice almost without exception have out earned me it's a cliche but that's not what life is all about yeah. I, I have a little bit more control over my over my schedule as a judicial officer and i don't know it, it was kind of a big deal when i was 25 years old to suddenly be a judicial officer i was just like the baby judge and i thought that was kind of cool <laughs> i guess <laughs> i found it interesting i love lawyers and not many people can say that, but I find lawyers to be interesting beyond belief. Uh, they have varied interests. They're intelligent, and there's a lot of – so I like working with them. This business is like a big puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, you get to put it together every day, and you're, you're working a little – the probate business in particular. And I guess I just – you know, I developed a flair for it, John, over – you know, by the time I was 10 years in, you could see that I was kind of good at this. And I liked that. I mean, I was good, and I could go into – court and I could help people pretty easily and that makes you feel good and so here I am now 37 years later and I'm still doing it mm -hmm. and I've been very privileged to work with some great people so the, the judges I've worked with over the years have been phenomenal I start with Judge Hines I almost get emotional when I think about him I've had two court reporters in my life first one who I still stay in touch with her name is uh, Janet Hare and now Kim Kendall Kim has now been with me for 26 27 years and they're just loyal and they work hard and they're smart and pleasant to work with and we've seen each other's kids grow up and it's been a, a good lifestyle that I've really enjoyed and uh, and I kind of had a flair for it kind of a family around here I, I took uh, pictures at Kim's wedding a few it, years indeed ago you did. Yeah, yeah, that <laughs> indeed was, you did that was neat you are also, you and your wife both are very involved in the community. Your, your wife also has a very important role in the community. Do you want you talk about that a little bit if you want to? Well, Linda has always been involved, almost always. She actually used to work, she was a consultant for the county a long time ago. You don't know anything about that. We'll talk about that some other day. That was one of the first things she was doing. She was involved in implementing a new phone system here, which goes back 30 years ago. And you, you're now looking at me like, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's almost the same 
long we still have. I've but, almost been here long yeah, enough. Right. Anyway, she's since for the most part though, my wife has been involved in the not-for-profit area, and uh, recently uh, she spent uh, 12 years at Vera Bradley, mm-hmm. and she was the head of the Vera Bradley Breast Cancer Foundation, and a tremendous job. But she's no longer there. She did that, and then. As, as a lot of people know, not everybody who's listening to this will know, but I had a cancer uh, situation last year that I went through personally, and I was out of work for four months, and I needed uh, some assistance. Let's put it that way, and Linda retired so she could take care of me. Fortunately, I'm now, the, to make that long, very long story short, I'm cancer-free, and uh, all systems are go, and I'm back at work, and I feel great. But anyway, so she's ready to go back to work. And in fact, in November 1, she went back to work and she's now still in the not-for-profit area. Mm -hmm. And she's working as the community outreach director for the Catholic Community Foundation. So she's kind of more into what she considers her wheelhouse. And she's very talented at planning events and making contacts and spreading the good news, so to speak. And uh, so that's what she does. What have I been involved in? I've been involved, not surprisingly, a lot in athletics and a few other things. And a lot of the things that I do have just kind of come out of athletics. I'm involved in a project that I love right now. It's a a leadership luncheon that we do once a year. It's called Beyond the Game, Mm -hmm. and it's in conjunction with the folks out at the Ash Center. And this came out of a a baseball camp that I organized a long time ago for Eric Wedge, who's a Fort Wayne native. And he ran a baseball camp for 15 years that he and I got started here back in the 90s. Anyway, we, we wanted to do something else. And so we honor each year at this leadership luncheon and it's coming up in February we have a guest speaker who comes in to motivate and we have four students from each high school and we have about over 25 area high schools that are represented and uh, it's the junior year students two male two female and the only requirement is they have to have played a varsity sport okay they don't have to be good at it they just have to be on the team but we want the athletic directors and the principals and the other people the coaches to identify those who show leadership not just in what they're doing with that team but also leadership potential and so we're trying to use athletics as a vehicle to help develop next year's or I should say next generation's leaders I think we have a little bit of an impact because we have a nice dinner or lunch for them we honor them those students and we encourage them to continue we have a speaker there at that so I've been doing that for about five or six years that's taken a lot a lot of my time but I've done a lot of coaching run the Rod Woodson football camp I was a founder of that back 92, 91, yeah. something like that. And again, I mentioned the the Eric Wedge camp. That was a big one. I've been on the board of trustees in the athletics area out at out at the University of St. Francis. I did that for many years. Yeah, a lot of it has to do with sports. Uh, you can tell I probably I do have a passion for sports. Well, I'm, I'm glad to see it back and <laughs> glad that Linda's back and involved in the community. And I remember the way my heart sank last year hearing about your diagnosis. And man, it's, it's good to be sitting here across from you again, hearing about your work and seeing that passion back in your face. Well, I can't tell you how good it is to be able to be sitting here. <laughs> it's a tremendous journey. And I, you know, I could talk for hours. I had some incredible doctors and met some incredible people and was treated right here in Fort, good old Fort Wayne and some just some great resources that got me through that and some great friends and a lot of prayer. It was there. It was real and it worked. We get into some really interesting things on this podcast. I had no idea what we were going to get into when we started doing this a few months ago. Let's talk about one more thing in the area of estates and, and probate before we get off into one more thing. Another question we get a lot in my office is from people who think that they may, maybe they're an heir to somebody's assets, but they haven't been included in the estate. Our last episode, episode 10, we're on episode 11 today, covered why court staff can't offer legal advice. So if we can do it without crossing over into that arena, what should somebody do if they feel that's the case? Well, it's it's an easy answer. Call their lawyer. Yeah, you're, you're, you're going to need some legal advice. Yeah. Now they can want that you can always you can always check to see if an estate is pending. Uh, maybe that's already the case based on your question that people usually say a case is pending. But if they think they have an interest in that estate and they're being treated unfairly, well, yeah, there's some things you can do. But mm-hmm. if I'm your lawyer, I'm, I'm going to ask you a whole bunch of questions before yeah. we before we draw a sword and, and start fighting here. Yeah before we determine what is best. That can be a difficult situation. And people in estates do fight. I mean, it does happen. And you know, you've seen it's been in movies and you see it all the time. It's a 
kind of a standard plot that somebody influences dad to rewrite the will and to favor one of the kids and mm -hmm. well that sort of thing does happen and you know so maybe you got a case but those are kind of difficult to prove yeah. and it's complex you probably need some legal advice the other thing that i would say is that if you think that the administrator of that estate say it's your brother mm -hmm. your ne'er-do-well brother who's running the estate he's the personal representative of the estate the court appointed him he's represented by a lawyer almost always is if you think he's not doing the job correctly and that happens that they're he's spending the money on himself doing things he shouldn't do with that responsibility again you probably need to get some legal advice yeah. <laughs> but you do have rights as mm -hmm. as an heir to an estate and you're an in, you're considered an interested party so you can intervene and and you can get answers to your questions but mm -hmm. you better get some legal advice it's it's that simple and you're right we can't give legal advice and people look yeah. at me and go i'm not asking for legal advice i go well you really are and I know you don't get that. And they go, well, why can't you tell me answer that question? I go, well, I can't be the judge and be your lawyer right. at the same time. And it's very because court employees are in the exact same position yep. as the judge. They're held to the same standard. And I think then that kind of dawns on people that yeah, there is a conflict of interest. You know, I can't be telling you how to be to do this and then be the one that judges whether you're doing it correctly. And that's that's why we can't give out any legal advice. That's the end of the story. And there's, there is not a form to fill out for as many things that people think there is a form to fill out for. These, these are complex legal issues. You wouldn't want to handle these things with a form rather than call a lawyer. There are forms, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of times I wish there weren't. Because, <laughs> because uh, you know, the forms actually that, that are in the probate area were developed with the idea to standardize what lawyers mm -hmm. used. And that's okay, because mm -hmm. they know how to use those forms, and, and, and if they don't apply to their situation, they know how to handle that. But those forms are available in this age of the Internet. Not surprisingly, it's, they're available online, so anybody can get their hands on those forms. And uh, just filling those forms out does not necessarily solve your problem. In fact, right. it rarely does, and a lot of times it makes things worse. So, I want to make sure that we talk about something else that you do that's really important to the people who need it, and that's the establishment of guardianships. This is a legal tool that's available to help people with diminished capacity or people with disabilities in managing their affairs. What is a guardianship and what are, are those folks appointed to accomplish? Well, the easy answer, to, well, there's no easy answer. It's it's varies case we, to case, we, I'm we, sure. we, it, it does a little bit, but what we're doing is when somebody is unable to uh, make decisions for themselves, either due to a legal incapacity or an actual incapacity, a, a physical or mental incapacity, then we somebody can be appointed to make those decisions for them. And usually we think about things about managing their estate, mm -hmm. and we think about food, clothing, shelter, making sure they're provided those things, where they're going to live, uh, medical care decisions. Those are the common things that you have to do. And there's two kinds of guardianships, and I, and, I, and I alluded to this when I said there's a legal incapacity mm -hmm. and then there's a physical or mental incapacity. A legal incapacity you are not competent to take care of yourself if you're under the age of 18. You're a minor. You're automatically eligible for a guardianship, but your parents are automatically your guardians. So we don't have to appoint them. There, there's some reasons why sometimes we have to appoint parents if you inherit money or something right. like that. But sometimes mom and dad can't take care of their kids, and so grandma or grandpa want to take over. Then we point, we can appoint them as guardian or aunt and uncle, somebody to take care of them. And that, that, that actually happens a lot. The other type of incapacity, though, is somebody that's over the age of 18. And these fall really into two big categories. One is somebody who is developmentally disabled. They were born with a disability, mm -hmm. and, and it, it's still, they're 18, and it's still the same, and they're unable to make decisions once they're an adult. So they need somebody still to stand in their shoes to make decisions for them, to keep them uh, you know, to, to make life decisions for them, where they're going to live, and things like that. Or the the other big category are is elderly people, mm -hmm. who are typically uh, it's the elderly population that that has uh, issues with dementia, Alzheimer's disease, things of that nature. You know, I suppose almost everybody's going to end up with some disabilities of those sorts if they live long enough. Right. Not everybody does, but a lot of times, mom, dad, 95 years old dementia diagnosis they're very forgetful they they are not man they're subject again just talking about to another lawyer about this today to being taken advantage of yeah 
financially and unfortunately in this world that happens a lot and there are a lot of scammers out there and if there's anything that makes me really mad it's somebody that would take advantage of an elderly person in that way and uh, so you don't want to be that person if that case comes in front of me and I think it's the the law treats it that way and you can see why uh, most people would be very upset about that in any event we can appoint guardians to protect their interests if they're showing that proclivity to to be taken advantage of and the statute there's a statute that defines exactly what an incapacity is and it's pretty expansive Uh, and if you fit into those categories and there's proper proof presented to the court and we have to have an investigation take place there's somebody that's appointed to represent that person's interest they're called a guardian ad litem they do an investigation and a recommendation to the court there's a lot of due process built into the guardianship process to make sure we don't just appoint guardians for anybody because it's kind of a significant thing. We're depriving somebody of civil rights all of a sudden. So we gotta make sure that they really do need a guardian. But in any event, that's basically what a guardian does. Then guardians are accountable to the court. The court will then monitor what they do as guardians to make sure that they're acting in the best interest of that person. They have to file accountings and things like that. I was just about to say, my my dad is a guardian for a a lady who's from his church. Uh, He and my mom met, husband passed away. She has issues with dementia. Uh, they they took over her responsibilities mm-hmm. some time ago, and, and it's not an easy task. It's People not. with good hearts may be tempted to do this. There are reporting requirements. You have to re- account for that person's assets. This may continue on for years. It might, but I don't want to dis- – I mean, people do these things, John, and you, yeah. I'm sure your parents would relate. They do it out of love yeah. for their yeah. fellow man and, and, and a desire to do the right thing. It is heartwarming, the stories that I see in my court all the time and having to do with parents who are taking care of their developmentally disabled children sometimes they can't even speak or they're they're profoundly disabled and they're sitting right here where we're almost sitting in a wheelchair and you know there's unfortunately uh, intellectually not not an ability to even really communicate with them sometimes and these parents do everything for them and they're in court asking me for the authority that they can continue to do everything for them on a day-to-day basis and it's the same thing with very difficult to say sometimes to be sitting in and we're again we're in a courtroom and I know this is great radio because I'm pointing someplace in that courtroom (laughs) but they're sitting right over there on the witness stand and they have to say things about mom who's sitting right here yeah. and and say, well, yeah, she did this, she did that, but it's necessary to protect their rights. Uh, it's not always a really pretty story, but it's hard to do, but they're doing it because they love their mom. They're not doing it. Sometimes they're doing it for money. They may have those uh, motivations, but it, it, you, you, you nailed it when you said it's a job. It's a job. And, it's, and it's a, it can be a hard job, and there's a lot to do. Um, but you do it because it's the right thing. Yeah. That's that's what we hope the motivation is, and that's what the process leads to. And guardianships cases. are not a one-size-fits-all proposition. They're tailored to fit the needs of the person. Yeah. And it's important to point out that person always retains certain rights, the right to vote, the right to visit with family and friends. Talk about that. Yeah, well, everything, you, you know, a guardian is uh, tasked statutorily with uh, uh, emphasize or I should say and uh, the words kind of escape me at this moment but it's uh, to engender as much independence and and let them be their own person as much as possible you have that has to be the goal of everything you do and if they have the ability to do certain things then uh, they should have that right under the guardianship to continue to mm-hmm. to manage maybe portions of their money or their estate or certainly their input when you're determining where they're going to live you know some folks are so unfortunately badly disabled that they really can't assist in that process but a lot of folks they could say oh i would much rather live here or in this place or something like that and those things need to be taken into account in every case so you know we want as much independence as possible for those folks and yes we can tailor the authority of that guardian to as narrowly fit the needs of that person as possible that's not a real easy thing to do because i mean we're in an area that's i mean it just, it just doesn't lend itself to oh it's obvious so we can check that box and we can check this this box but but we can limit things effectively in some areas and i always tell guardians you know you got a job to do and that is to make this person as happy and as comfortable yeah. as possible and to let give them as much foster as much independence as you possibly can so before we wrap up let's talk about resources for a moment we've 
barely scratched the surface of some very complex issues. If, if people find themselves with questions, what resources here in the Allen County community do you typically recommend people reach out to? Yeah, there's there are actually two things I want to talk about mm-hmm. in that area primarily. The first is the Allen County Bar Association Lawyer Referral Service. Yeah, I think that price went up. It was thirty bucks for the consultation, but I think it might be forty I think now. It's forty now. Forty now. Yep. But for that amount of money, you, you know, you, you call them on the phone. They're going to refer you to a probate lawyer, a lawyer that practices in this area, whether it be guardianship or estate, and you can specify when you talk to the intake person from the Allen County Bar Association, and they will get you to somebody where in you, for a half hour you can sit down and hash this thing out, and that lawyer at the end of the half hour can tell you what they think and what you need. That's a pretty good bargain. Now, in the guardianship, and legal line is another, and, and that runs once a month, I don't know. That Actually, it's every Tuesday. Every, every Tuesday, Tuesday right. okay. I should, I should know more about that, but that's great. You can call. It's not fair. We did, Episode 10 was all about legal, <laughs> legal line, line and lawyer referral service, so I'm cheating. Well, it's good. Uh, VL, uh, the, I should say legal line is, is a good way. If you've just got a specific question, and maybe that's an, your on, entree to really realizing that, yeah, I really do need a lawyer. Mm-hmm. But uh, you can yeah, you call up, talk to a lawyer on the phone. It's free. Uh, good deal. Tuesday nights. The other program that I am really super happy with and proud of is uh, through the Volunteer Lawyer Program, mm-hmm. and they have a guardianship program. Almost without exception, and I've maybe already said this, folks who are trying to get appointed as guardians are trying to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. It's a good thing that they are trying to do. But a lot of times... Why should it be a financial burden on them to go out and have to hire a lawyer and yeah. do all this? And yeah, that's that's an important. Now with some folks, it's just you know it's not really an issue, and it it's all relative. But it doesn't cost that much money, but it does cost you money. Yeah. And for years, we we had a situation in in Allen County, and really it, it persists in many parts of the state where folks needed guardians. Particularly, this is with the kids who age out and reach the age of 18 and they're developmentally disabled. We see this a lot with those cases, but also frequently for elderly folks and somebody needs to take care of them, but they don't really have the money. Well, the cost to do that come out of the estate of that person if they have money, but sometimes they don't even have money, but they need a guardian. We had some funding issues with we had programs off and on where people were had money so that that we had a guardian the volunteers we'd get volunteer lawyers and all this stuff and they would do these cases pro bono for free but the funding would run out so that program would last two years three years whatever and that was persistent that that would go on and somebody else would come along and i would be encouraging them we just couldn't find a stable source of, of funding well about 10, 15 years ago now, the volunteer lawyer program here locally took on and started what they call their guardianship program. Mm -hmm. If you qualify for the VLP, they've got a full, not a full-time, but a part-time coordinator, but this is what their only job is. They do all the uh, paralegal type work to set these cases up. Lawyers volunteer to serve as lawyer for the guardians, the proposed guardians, and also lawyers the the guardian ad litems the ones who have to do the uh, investigation so you need two lawyers in most guardianship cases so we've got lots a a fair amount of volunteer lawyers who are willing to do 10 cases a year like this i do i don't know 30 or 40 guardianships like that a year maybe probably more see we have a guardianship morning like once a month and i'm sitting right up there behind you i'm pointing here we go on radio i'm pointing again and uh you know we'll do about seven five six seven cases in a morning and appoint guardians for folks and it's all done for free these are folks who don't have assets of their own and and the petitioners also qualify for the program so they can't afford to fire a higher lawyer either but it's a stable program it's been around 10 15 years and i sleep better at night knowing that we have uh, met a community need for guardians for those people through that program and i'm, I'm just really proud that we finally I think we nailed it. And I, I talk to judges around the state and other people who are, you know, wanting to do the right thing. And, well, we've got all these people who need guardians. And they, they come up with all these ideas of forms and everything mm-hmm. else. And I go, look at what Allen County has done. And we protect all the due process. And we're not just using forms because those forms get people in trouble. And they don't like to hear that a lot of times. But that's just my opinion. We have met that need. And you can do it, too, in your community because lawyers – Generally, they got a pretty big heart, and they're willing to—they're willing to volunteer for those cases, particularly if I ask them to. 
You know, when we started this podcast a few months ago, the primary objective was to spread the word about the good work going on in the Allen County Courts, and it doesn't get a whole lot better than the work that you're doing here to help people out when they really, really need it, and you should be proud of it. Well, I appreciate that. Thank Magistrate you. Magistrate Phil Huck, thank you for being on In Session. It's been my pleasure. I like a Somebody told me a long time ago I never met a microphone I didn't want to talk into. So. <laughs> but it's been great to talk to you, and it's been a great ride for 37 years, and I've got a few more years left in me. We hope so. You're doing great work. Thank you. This has been In Session, an inside look at the Allen County, Indiana courts. You can find out more on this topic and others at allensuperiorcourt.us. Thanks for listening. The next episode's coming right up.